order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Gavin Robinson. Question number one, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'm sure the whole House will wish to join me in offering our warmest congratulations to their Royal Highnesses, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, on the birth of their son earlier this week. Mr Speaker, I know members across the House will want to join me in marking Stephen Lawrence's death 25 years ago. For each of those years, the Lawrence family have fought heroically to ensure that their son's life and death will never be forgotten. And as I announced earlier this week, the Government will work with the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust to establish a national annual commemoration of Stephen's life and legacy. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Gavin Robinson. Uh, Mr Speaker, on behalf of my right hon. Colleagues uh, and hon. Colleagues, can we uh, acknowledge the fortitude of the Lawrence family and indeed the joy that this nation shares uh, on a royal yeah, birth? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, in 2017, through the Confidence and Supply Agreement, the Prime Minister not only recognised the need uh, to give Northern Ireland an economic boost, she agreed a package of measures including a Belfast region city deal, a city deal for others and ultra-fast broadband investment that will transform our part of this United Kingdom. In responding with the, uh, to the eager anticipation of our communities and in reaffirming her commitment, will she ensure sufficient progress is made to advance both in time for the autumn budget? Well, can I say to the honourable gentleman that he's raised uh, has raised an important issue. He's absolutely right. The government has set out several public commitments, including in the confidence and supply agreement, to work towards a comprehensive and ambitious set of city deals across Northern Ireland. There is progress being made, which I welcome, uh, in, by the Belfast City Region partners in developing the city deal proposals. I look forward to their submission, which will be considered, obviously, by the government. Of course, in the absence of an executive, there are some issues to work through. But can I assure the honourable gentlemen that my right honourable friend, the Northern Ireland Secretary, is committed to working positively with partners in the UK Government, the Belfast City Region and the Northern Ireland Civil Service to progress the city deal. Andrew Bowie. Yeah. 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 Earlier than expected, Mr Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, yesterday the Welsh Government reached an agreement with Her Majesty's Government on uh, the withdrawal very bill. Good. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that it's in the interest of Scottish business and the Scottish people to, uh, that the Scottish National Party leadership should do the same yes. and reach a similar agreement as soon as possible. Yes. Can I say to my honourable friend that I am pleased that we're making progress with regard to the withdrawal bill. I think that's been acknowledged by all sides and after many months of negotiation, and I'd like to pay tribute to my right honourable friends, particularly the uh, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, for the work he has done in those negotiations. But after many months, we have reached agreement with the Welsh Government. It's a significant achievement. It will provide legal certainty, increase the powers of the devolved governments and respect the devolution settlements. We've made considerable changes to the Bill to reflect issues raised by members and by the devolved administrations. It is indeed disappointing that the Scottish Government have not yet felt able to add their agreement to the new amendments, and we sincerely hope that they will reconsider their position. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I join the Prime Minister in congratulating the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge on the birth of their baby, and I wish them well. I think we should also reflect that um, Doreen and Neville Lawrence fought for years to get justice for the death of their son. The Macpherson inquiry showed that institutional racism was a major factor in the inquiry. We need to drive out institutional racism in all its forms, wherever it raises its head within our society. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker we recognise that the Home Secretary has rightly apologised to the Windrush generation and made a commitment to compensate people for the hardship they have endured. The Government is committed to compensation in theory, but as yet nothing in practice. There is an understandable lack of trust by the Windrush generation. So can the Prime Minister today be clear and confirm that those British citizens who have worked paid taxes here for decades, wrongly denied pensions and benefits, will be fully compensated. Can I first of all say to the right honourable gentleman, it is absolutely right that across this House 
We should all be absolutely clear in our determination to ensure that we stamp out racism in every form. Let me, uh, but let me set out the House the action that has been taken, uh, because my right honourable friend did uh, make very clear the offering the other day in her statement before the House that those who came here before the 1st of January 73 from Commonwealth countries, this is from Commonwealth countries as a whole. Uh, will be offered citizenship status without paying the fee, without taking the knowledge of language and life in the UK test. And the children of that generation, the Windrush generation who are in the UK, will in most cases be British citizens already, but they will also uh, be, where that's not the case, they'll be able to apply to naturalise at no further cost. We're also taking action in relation to those who made their life here but retired to their country of origin and have found it difficult or impossible to return to the UK and will work with High Commissions to make sure they can easily uh, access the offer of formal British citizenship because the Windrush generation are British. They are part of us. Uh, and there will be a compensation scheme, which my right honourable friend, uh, my right honourable friend, will set the details of that compensation scheme out in due course. But I think everybody will see that the action the government has taken is because we know these Windrust generation. Oh, the, the Labour front bench shake their heads and go, oh no. The Windrust generation are British. They are part of us, and we will ensure that. Mr Speaker, it's not an act of generosity to waive citizenship fees when they're British citizens already and they should be granted full status immediately. Mr Speaker, four years ago an internal Home Office memo stated that her hostile environment policies could make it harder for people like the Windrush generation to find homes and, in its own words, provoke discrimination. Why did the Home Secretary ignore that memo? The right, honourable, the right Honourable Gentleman talks about a hostile environment. What we are proposing here will, I think, flush illegal migrants out. We are trying to create a much more hostile environment in this country if you are here illegally. Those are not my words. They are the words of the Right Honourable Member for Birmingham Hodge Hill when he was Labour Immigration Minister. And the Labour Leader ought to know about this because the Right Honourable Gentleman sits on his front bench. Jeremy Corbyn. Speaker, what I'm talking about is the Windrush generation of people who came here completely legally. The Prime Minister herself was warned by my friend, the member for Hackney North and Soak Newington, who is now the Shadow Home Secretary, directly about these policies in 2014. And when that Act was going through Parliament, the then Community Secretary, Eric Pickles, wrote to her warning the costs and risks considerably outweigh the benefits. Why did she ignore his advice, as well as the request from my honourable friend? I say to the right honourable gentleman, in relation to the Windrush generation, we have made absolutely clear that the Windrush generation, those people who came here from the Commonwealth before the 1st of January 1973, have a right to be here. They are British. They are part of us. The problem, the problem at the time was that they were not documented with that right, and that is what we are now putting right. He talks about action that the government has taken in relation to those who are here illegally. The Windrush generation are here legally. Action against those who are here illegally has been taken by successive governments. Checks on, economic, on someone's right to work here came in in 1997. Measures on access to benefits in 1999. Civil penalties for employing illegal migrants in 2008, both under a Labour government. And why have these actions been taken? Because people up and down this country want to ensure that the government is taking action on those people who are here illegally. It is, it is not fair to those people who work hard, who have a right to be here, who have contributed to this country, if they see people who are here illegally being given the same access to rights and services. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister seems to want to get away from the injustice done to the Windrush generation. 
the Equalities and Human Rights Commission warned about the 2016 Immigration Act, saying the bill is likely to lead to destitution and may cause inhuman and degrading treatment in breach of Article 3 of the European Convention of Human Rights. They've quite rightly apologised for the scandalous way in which British citizens have been treated, but it was due to the 2014 and 16 Immigration Acts. So will the Prime Minister now commit to reviewing that legislation to make sure this never happens again? As I set out for the House last week, this is a generation who came here prior to 1973. The Labour front bench say we know this, but the questions that the Right Honourable Gentleman is asking suggest that they're ignoring some of the facts in relation to this. This, this, this is a generation who came here prior to 1973. We are not ignoring, we are not ignoring the problems that some members of this generation are facing. That is why my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has set out a special team in the Home Office to deal with their inquiries, not just deal with their inquiries, but actively help them to find the documentation to clarify their status. That is why we have made the offer that my right honourable friend made of ensuring we can give them a formal British citizenship, which recognises that they are British, but does so in a formal, uh, documented way. The problem was that back prior to 1973, when the, when the Windrush generation came here, they were not given documents that set out their status. We are now putting that right, and we will leave no stone unturned to put that right. Jeremy Corbyn. Speaker, in 2013, the then Home Secretary said it was about creating a really hostile environment, and that's why she was introducing the legislation. Had the Windrush generation not mounted the campaign that they have, had members on this side of the House not raised the matter persistently, there would be no compensation, there would be no review, there would be no apology. But, Mr Speaker, any review of legislation needs to be wider than just immigration law. The dismantling of legal aid provision in 2012 made the impact of the 2014 Immigration Act harder to, uh, harder to challenge. These policies swept up British citizens and legal migrants, causing them immense suffering, as she was warned. So can the Prime Minister send a clear message today and tell us the hostile environment is over and that her bogus immigration targets that have driven this hostile culture will be scrapped? The Windrush generation have served this country and deserve better than this. The Windrush generation are British. They have contributed to this country. They have made their life here. Dealing with those people who are here illegally, not the Windrush generation, they are here legally. There are people who are in this country illegally. And I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman again, I've quoted the Right Honourable Member for Birmingham Hodge Hill when he was Labour's Immigration Minister. The Leader of the Opposition referred to 2013. In 2013, the then Shadow Home Secretary, the Right Honourable Member for uh, Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford said, we need much stronger action from Government to bring illegal immigration down. front bench are saying the Windrush generation are not illegal. They are not illegal. They are here legally. That is, that, is why, that is why we are providing the support to enable them to get the documents for their, uh, for their status. What we are talking about, what the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, is talking about is whether or not we should deal with illegal immigration. And up and down this country, the British public will tell him we should deal with illegal immigration. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, we're talking about the environment created by her as Home Secretary for six years when she knew full well, she knew full well of the problems the Windrush generation were facing. At last, she's been forced to act upon it. 
Last week, the current Home Secretary admitted the Home Office sometimes loses sight of the individual. Yet we now know that when she took over from a predecessor, her intent was to harden this cruel and misdirected policy, pledging to do so ruthlessly. A report last month by immigration officials stated the hostile environment measures were not even having the desired effect. The current Home Secretary inherited a failing policy and made it worse. Isn't it time she took responsibility and resigned? must calm itself. We've got a long way to go and a lot of backbenchers' questions to reach. Let's hear the Prime Minister. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman that up and down this country, people want to ensure that the government is taking action against those people who are here in this country illegally, those people who are here illegally, because it isn't fair that people who work hard day in and day out, who contribute to this country, who put into the life of this country, are seeing people who are here illegally accessing services in the same way. We are acting to ensure that those people who are here legally are given the support that they need. We welcomed the Rindras generation those many years ago. We, uh, they are British, they are part of us, and we are ensuring that they remain here and are able to continue to live their lives here. But it is also right that this government takes action against those people who are accessing services despite being here illegally and not putting in and not contributing to this country. And I say to the right honourable gentleman, if he wants to talk, if he wants to talk, about issues of fairness, if he wants to talk about a government that is kind, then let's just look and see what a Labour government would be like. Because a Labour government, a Labour government that would wreck our economy, that would damage people's jobs, that would destroy, that would tax people and end up with debt for future generations, is not a Labour government that is kind or fair to anybody. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sure the whole House will want to pass on its condolences to the family of Matt Campbell, who sadly died taking part in the London Marathon. Will the Prime Minister join me in congratulating the 40,000 runners, including many right right honourable and honourable members from this place, who completed the marathon, raising huge amounts of money for local charities and good causes across the United Kingdom. And in particular, we should thank the volunteers, the medics and the ambulance staff who made the event as safe as possible. Yeah. Gentlemen, he shouldn't be too shy about it. <laughs> Prime Minister. Well, first of all, may I join my honourable friend in paying tribute to Matt Campbell. And I understand his Just Giving page has now raised over £140,000 for the Brathay Trust, uh, which works to inspire vulnerable young people to make positive changes in their lives. I'm I'm sure members across the House will want to join me in offering condolences to his family and friends. But I'm also happy to join my honourable friend in congratulating uh, the runners in this weekend's London Marathon, including those 15 members from this House who competed, and if I may say so, particularly my honourable friend, who was the fastest member of Parliament in the Marathon, com- com- completing it because we should have it on record in three hours and 38 minutes. Many congratulations my honourable friend, but it's also right that we pay tribute to those ambulance workers and medical staff who, for all that they did on the day to enable this to take place. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I, on behalf of those of us on these benches, pass on congratulations to the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and the birth of the son, and I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister and Stephen Lawrence. Mr Speaker, the CBI... The NFU, the Scottish Government, the Welsh Government, the House of Lords and overwhelming members of this House want the UK to remain in the Customs Union. Why is the Prime Minister on the side of her cynical Brexiteers, front benchers and not working in the interests of all the nations of the United Kingdom? 
what uh, that the British people voted to leave the European Union. In voting to leave the European Union, they voted to leave the single market and the customs union. We will. What we want to ensure is that we, as a country, are able to negotiate independently, negotiate free trade deals around the rest of the world. Uh, that we are also able to ensure that we deliver on our commitment for no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and that we have as frictionless a border as possible between the United Kingdom and the European Union. What businesses tell me is that they want that tariff-free, frictionless border, and that's what we're negotiating for them. Blackford. Mr Speaker, that answer simply isn't good enough. The single market and the customs union, quite simply, were not on the ballot paper. Yeah, yeah, the Prime yeah. Minister's own government analysis shows almost every sector of the economy and every region of the United Kingdom would be negatively impacted if the UK leaves the customs union. Negotiations in Brussels are effectively at a standstill because the government are bereft of ideas on how to deal with the Irish border issue. Why is it that jobs, living standards, even the Good Friday Agreement are all secondary concerns to this government? Will the Prime Minister confirm now that if this place votes in favour of a customs union, that will be the negotiating position of her government? Can I say to the right honourable gentleman that he is wrong in so many of the statements that he's just made? First of all, this government is not bereft of ideas in terms of how we can approach the issue of the Northern Ireland border because we have published proposals for dealing with that, uh, that very issue. But if he wants to listen to Scottish businesses, I suggest he listens to those businesses who uh, just yesterday, uh, uh, on the, uh, from the Food and Drink Federation, Scotland, Scotland, Scottish Bakers, Scottish Retail Consortium, said Scotland's businesses benefit enormously from the existing and largely unfettered UK single market. The SNP government in Scotland should listen to that. Dr Andrew Murison. At Thursday's recovery meeting in Salisbury, the public was told that nine Novichok hotspots remain in the city and around the city and that the clean-up may take until the end of the year. In thanking the Prime Minister for her very close uh, interest in this matter, can I ask what more can be done to expedite the clean-up so that life in South Wiltshire can return to normal as soon as possible? Well, can I thank my, my honourable friend because he has raised an important issue and I'm very happy to update the House on, on this issue. And first of all, can I make it absolutely clear that Public Health England have said Salisbury is safe for residents and visitors. There's no need for anyone to take any additional precautions. Cordons are in place to protect the public while decontamination work is carried out on the sites that my honourable friend has referred to. And after decontamination is undertaken at each site, sampling will be carried out to ensure that the sites are safe to be released back to the public. But I can assure my honourable friend uh, that it, the need to expedite this work is well recognised, but we want, of course, to ensure that it is, uh, it is done in a way that, that site, those sites will in the future be uh, available to the public and will be safe for the public. Neil Gray. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Around 20 of my constituents, mostly living around Hart Hill, and 4,000 uh, other low-paid workers around the UK are waiting for money that is rightfully theirs. They have been waiting 20 years. Some will have died waiting and others are now seriously ill. And you, Mr Speaker, represent, uh, and as do other members across this House, represent um, constituents waiting for their payout from the Road Chef Employee Benefit Trust, which has been trying to get HMRC to take a decision on £10, uh, £10 million pounds wrongly paid to them 18 years ago. Yep. Will the Prime Minister join me today in calling on HMRC to finally decide on this case and get the money yeah, back yeah. to the people who rightly deserve yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say to uh, the Honourable Gentleman that I understand he raised this case with my right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, last, uh, uh, last week. Uh, my honourable friend, the Financial Secretary, has offered to meet him to discuss the wider issue. HMRC is working closely with the trustees' representatives to resolve the case uh, and will be meeting them next month. HMRC is operationally independent, and I think that is, uh, that is important. They must, of course, apply the law fairly, collect the taxes set out in legislation by Parliament, but they are working with the uh, trustees' representatives. And as I said, my honourable friend, the Financial Secretary, is happy to meet the honourable gentleman to discuss this. Richard Drax. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I commend my right honourable friend for reaffirming 
the government's clear position that we will not be remaining in any form of a customs union. And while on the EU, can she reassure fishermen in South Dorset and fishermen around the country, especially the under 10 metre fleet, that they will not be disadvantaged by any incoming EU policies during the implementation period? Obviously, this question of fisheries is a matter that he and others have raised previously. And during the can I reassure him that during the implementation period, we have negotiated that the UK's share of catch cannot be reduced. I think it safeguards the livelihoods of our fishing communities <laughs> and, importantly, also delivers a smooth and orderly Brexit. There is also an obligation in the agreement on both sides to act in good faith and uh, throughout that implementation period, and any attempts by the EU to harm the UK fishing ob- uh, industry would obviously breach that obligation. But obviously in December 2020, uh, we will be negotiating fishing opportunities as a third country, as a fully independent coastal state, deciding who can have access to our waters on what, and on what terms for the first time in over 40 years. Douglas Chapman. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Prime Minister, you will be aware that in my constituency we are putting the finishing touches to our second year aircraft carrier, the Prince of Wales. But as we near the end of that contract, over 400 people in the recite yard are now facing redundancy, with many more job losses in the pipeline. Will the Prime Minister visit Dunfermline and West Fife to explain to the recite workforce face-to-face why her government intends to award a £1 billion shipbuilding contract to yards out with these islands when we have the skills, the talent and the infrastructure to deliver right here? Prime Minister. Here, here. Yeah, honourable, can I say to the honourable gentleman that what we are doing through our national shipbuilding strategy is focusing on giving the Royal Navy the ships it needs while increasing economic growth across the country and investing in a more skilled workforce. So we are uh, encouraging a more competitive industry in shipbuilding and growing jobs across the uh, country. I think he may have uh, been referring to the. Uh, future uh, support ships for the Royal Fleet Auxiliary uh, being procured through international competition. Um, That's three ships. They will be built in the Fleet Solid Support Programme. They will be subject to international competition to secure the best possible value for money for the UK taxpayer. But what we are doing what we are doing through our national shipbuilding strategy is ensuring that we develop that shipbuilding capability here in the UK in a way that we can encourage all UK shipyards with the necessary skills and expertise to continue to engage in that particular programme. Tradinic. Is my right honourable friend aware that according to the World Health Organisation, the second largest medical system in the world with 300,000 doctors treating 200 million patients every year is homeopathy? Yeah. Will my right honourable friend congratulate the doctor? Order! Order! This is very discourteous. I want to hear the views of the honourable gentleman on this matter. Will she congratulate the doctors who are members of the Faculty of Homeopathy on their work in the health service and particularly dealing with cases that are too difficult to treat conventionally? And does she agree with me that homeopathic vets should be able to make their own minds up about whether they use homeopathy on its own or other treatments as well? Can I say to to my honourable friend, uh, he has been a long-standing advocate in this House for homeopathy. Um, And uh, obviously some patients who are treated in the NHS and in the private sector are users of complementary and alternative therapies. But it is the responsibility of the local NHS to make decisions on the commissioning and funding of healthcare treatments and to take account of issues around safety, clinical and cost effectiveness and the availability of suitably qualified and regulated practitioners. And I think for all the uh, issues that he's addressed, it is right that those who are professionally uh, are able to make these judgments are left to make those judgments. Is McGuinness. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In my constituency of Hayward and Middleton in the borough of Rochdale, one in three of Year 6 children are overweight or obese. And with our children being bombarded with junk food ads on their favourite television programmes, on billboards and even on bus tickets, will the Prime Minister take the bold steps needed to tackle junk food marketing and support Jamie Oliver's latest campaign and say that she too has had enough? 
I say to the Honourable Lady, we already have uh, uh, plans to tackle childhood obesity that are world leading. No other developed country has done anything as ambitious. Our uh, soft drinks industry levy, that is bold action that we are taking. Our sugar reduction programme is going to cut the amounts of sugar consumed by young people. And of course, we are putting in plans in relation to the amount of exercise that primary school children get uh, every day, physical activity that they get every day. Those steps will make a real difference and a real help in reversing a problem that has been decades in the making. But of course, we haven't ruled out further action if the right results aren't seen. Does the Prime Minister agree? that events since the very powerful debate on anti-Semitism that we held in this chamber have demonstrated that Labour are still not taking this problem seriously and now they need to take urgent action to root out this form of racism from their party. Can I say to my right honourable friend that of course she raises an extremely important issue. As I said right at the very beginning in response uh, to uh, the right honourable gentleman, the leader of the opposition, it is important that everybody across this house takes action to stamp out racism in all its forms, and I include in that uh, anti-Semitism. Alison Thewlis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I see the results of the Prime Minister's hostile environment and my casework every single day. My constituents, Mr. Sheikh and Ms. Gould, applied for leave to remain on the same day, the 27th of March, 2017. He was granted, but she was refused on the 28th of March, a full year later. The couple's five-year-old and their four-month-old are both British citizens, but Mrs Gould has been told she should be ready to leave the UK. Why does the Prime Minister want to separate this family, and will she intervene? Can I say to the Honourable Lady, as she knows full well, that those who are working in the the UK visas and immigration section of the Home Office look at every case very carefully, but she's 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 made her point in this House. And I'm sure that the Home Office will look again at this case. Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the City of London has recently topped the worldwide Z Yen index, and it supports 450,000 jobs and is worth £45 billion to the UK economy. Would my right honourable friend agree? that it is essential for both the EU and the UK that the final Brexit agreement supports these financial services, otherwise they will simply move elsewhere in the world. Can I say to my honourable friend that this is an important issue. I I, uh, referred to this in my Mansion House speech, where I said that we wanted to ensure that financial services were a part of the deep and comprehensive partnership we want to build with the uh, EU27. Our goal should be establishing access to each other's markets. That should be based on maintaining the same regulatory outcomes over time, uh, with a mechanism that determines proportionate consequences where they are not maintained. That is part of my ambition for an economic partnership with the European Union that goes way beyond any existing free trade agreement, covering more sectors and cooperating more fully. My honourable friend is right. Uh, that actually, if firms are looking in financial services are looking to go elsewhere, they are more likely to look to go elsewhere in the world rather than elsewhere yeah. in Europe. Yeah. Colleen Fletcher. Yeah. A stem cell transplant can be a life-saving treatment for people with blood cancer. Recent research shows that having a younger stem cell donor improves a patient's chance of surviving post-transplant. Will the Prime Minister join me in supporting the upcoming Be a Lifesaver campaign by the charity Anthony Nolan, which aims to recruit more young people aged 16 to 30 to the stem cell donor register? And will she congratulate the 1,000 people in Coventry North East and all others who are already signed up to be donors. Well, I'm happy to join her in congratulating those people in Coventry and elsewhere who have signed up already to be donors. Anthony Lonan has done excellent work over many years. I wasn't aware of the particular campaign that she has referred to, but I will certainly look into it. It sounds like a very good campaign, and I'm sure she will be encouraging other members of this House to support it as well. Pausey! Mr Speaker, um, Mr Speaker, increasing numbers of 
children of school age are now being educated at home. Does the Prime Minister agree that it's important to ensure that these children receive an education that's appropriate for their needs? Yeah. Yes. Can I say to my honourable friend, I think this is very important. Sometimes for you know, parents will decide to educate their children at home. They will have uh, their reasons for wishing to do so. But it's important that those children do get an appropriate quality and level of education. And I can reassure my honourable friend that I know that this is an issue that the Secretary of State for Education is looking at. Lucy Powell. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. On Saturday, I met a lovely young couple who had all but given up hope of ever being able to buy their own home. But thanks to an innovative, genuinely affordable housing scheme by Manchester City Council, they had just moved into their own house right near the university. So will she join me in praising Manchester Labour, who, despite her... Uh, planning and funding restrictions have built many hundreds of truly affordable homes in my constituency and will have another 2,000 coming on stream uh, very soon. Well, I'm happy to say to the Honourable Lady that I think it is important that we are providing homes and building more homes for people and within that that we include affordable homes too. And I'm pleased to say that since, uh, 2000, since we came in in 2010 we've delivered more affordable homes in the last seven years than the last seven years of the last Labour government. But I'm happy to. It is in fact the government is working with Manchester and with the Mayor of Manchester and the combined authority to ensure that we are, um, we are supporting in certain areas with funding and encouraging that building of affordable homes and indeed ensuring that there are those homes that young people can aspire so that they can get their foot on that property ladder for those who never thought they'd be able to do so. Andrea Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Brunclyffe Academy in Morley recently scored outstanding during the Ofsted inspection and Newlands Academy, also in Morley, scored good for the very first time in its history. Can the Prime Minister confirm to the House that under this Conservative Government, since 2010, an additional 1.8 million children are now taught in good and outstanding schools? And I hope the Prime Minister will join me in congratulating the principals, teachers, staff and students at the two schools for their hard work to obtain this admirable achievement. Well, can I say to my honourable friend, I'm very happy to, uh, to congratulate, join her in congratulating the uh, teachers and heads and all the staff of the uh, two schools that she has mentioned in the achievements that they have, uh, that they have uh, got uh, as a result of uh, the work that they have been doing. She asked me to confirm that uh, there are now 1.8 million more children in good or outstanding schools. I'm afraid I'm not able to confirm that because, in fact, there are now 1.9 million more children in good or outstanding schools. And Carden! Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent Anthony, who lives with a chronic disabling illness, has worked all his life until finishing on medical grounds three years ago. Since 2002, he's received disability living allowance, but last year was transferred to PIP and his mobility allowance was cut. Yesterday, Anthony handed back his mobility vehicle he's had for 16 years, and today he is housebound and fearful for his future. The total injustice of the system means that he now faces a nine-month wait for his appeal at Liverpool Tribunal Services. What message does the Prime Minister have for Anthony as he adjusts to his new life as a prisoner in his own home? I say to the honourable gentleman, I'm sorry to hear of the case that he has raised. Obviously, as we as all members of this house will know, uh, there are cases where people have uh, had to appeal against judgments that have been made in relation to these. But uh, I can, I will ensure that the Department of Work and Pensions is aware of the particular case that he has raised in this house. Will Quince. In October last year, the National Bereavement Care Pathway was launched in 11 pilot sites. Last week it launched in a further 21 hospital sites. And yesterday I'm delighted to announce that the Government has set aside funding for a national rollout of the National Bereavement Care Pathway. Will my right honourable friend join me in welcoming this funding, which will make such a difference to bereaved parents up and down this country? Well, can I say to my honourable friend, this is a a, a subject which he has... uh, championed and campaigned on and with great personal commitment to this and uh, I recognise uh, the importance and that's why the government is is putting the funding in of providing this uh, bereavement counselling and supporting parents who are in those most difficult circumstances where they've filed. Sir Vincent Cable. 
the uh, Prime Minister will be aware of the concern that if the Home Office cannot deal humanely and efficiently with the immigration status of 50,000 uh, UK residents of Caribbean origin, they will seriously struggle to deal efficiently and humanely with 3 million European national registration. Can she address the particular concern that under the Data Protection Bill, the Home Office is now taking powers to cover up future mistakes by blocking access to individual files sought by individuals and their lawyers to check the accuracy of their data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the interpretation that the right honourable gentleman has put on uh, that is not correct in that the, uh, uh, it will be possible for people to access information that they need to have available. Uh, what I would say to him, he's referred to the issue about EU citizens. There is a, a real difference between a situation where people came to this country but were not given documented status in this country. And that is the issue that we're dealing with with the Windrush generation. They've contributed to this country, they've lived here, but at no stage, <laughs> when they came here, they were not given that documentary evidence. To, there's a difference with the system we're putting in place for EU citizens, where EU citizens are being encouraged and asked to apply for that settled status so that they have the evidence of their status. We are making sure that this is a problem, the problem uh, will not occur in relation to EU citizens. Ben Bradley. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This week we'll be talking about higher education in this place. Does my right honourable friend agree that the action we're taking uh, as a, a government shows that a Conservative government is committed to delivering for students, working with them and treating them as adults, yeah, yeah. in stark contrast with members opposite yeah, yeah, yeah. who look to win votes from young people by offering illogical and undeliverable free stuff? Yeah. Yeah. To my honourable friend, he's, he's absolutely right. Uh, first of all, the review we're bringing in on tertiary education is about ensuring not just that the funding and financing of ter tertiary education is right, but also uh, that pe young people have access to the routes through education, be it technical or university, that suits their particular needs. And of course, last year, the right honourable gentleman, the leader of the opposition, said that he would deal with uh, student debt. Uh, students thought he was going to abolish student debt. What happens after the election? He goes back on his promise. Yvette Cooper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I was not going to raise this, but the Prime Minister quoted me. Let me say to the Prime Minister, do not try to hide behind me or the Labour Party when she was warned repeatedly that the damage her obsession with her net migration target was doing. Do not try to hide behind the Cabinet when they don't agree with you on this and are trying to clear up the mess. And do not try to hide behind civil servants. Yes. I order. I'm not having the questioner interrupted. It will be heard, and it will be heard in full. And that's the end of it. Yvette Cooper. Do not try to hide behind civil servants when she set the policies, instilled in them the culture of disbelief. And when the High Commissioners told us this morning that they had warned the Foreign Office about the Windrush generation immigration problems in 2016, what did she do? Because a few years ago the Prime Minister said, I'm actually sick and tired of a government minister who simply blames other people when something goes wrong. What's changed? Can I say to the right... I say to the right honourable lady, nobody is trying to blame anybody else. This, the issue, the question of the Windrush generation arises from the fact that when they came here, when they came here, they were not documented. Their status to live here was not documented. Over the years, yes, there have been individual cases over the years of people who have had to regularise their documentation and have done so. We have now seen cases of people in difficulty because they have not been able to do that. That is why the Home Office is taking action to deal with that. But for governments of every colour, including the government in which the Right Honourable Lady served, action has been taken against illegal immigrants. This does not apply to the Windrush generation. They are here, they are British, they have a right to be here. But under Labour, action was taken to, for a compliant environment. Under the Conservatives, action has been taken to deal with illegal immigrants. 
That is what we are doing. I have apologised to the Windrush generation, and I do so again. We are doing everything we can to ensure that they are reassured that they do not have the anxiety that some of the generation have had. But we also owe it to them and to the British people to ensure we deal with people who are here illegally. Dr Julian Lewis. Does my right honourable friend still subscribe to her excellent maxim that no deal is better than a bad deal? And does she acknowledge that locking ourselves into a customs union with the EU after Brexit would be a very bad deal indeed? Well, I'm I'm very happy to confirm what I've always said. Uh, No deal is better than a bad deal. As regards a customs union, uh, being in a customs union means we would not be able to negotiate our own trade deals around the rest of the world. And that's exactly what we want to do, is to be able to do that. And as I saw last week with the Commonwealth heads of government, there's considerable interest around the rest of the world in being able to have those independent trade deals negotiated between other countries and the UK. David Lammy. In 2011, I wrote to her then Immigration Minister, the member for Ashford, about my constituent who came here in 1956, aged four, and in 2011 was told (coughs) that he could no longer work and he did not have British citizenship. Her minister wrote to me and basically said, tough. Can she now explain in a little more detail what compensation will be available for my constituent who has been unable to work since 2011, for seven years? And will she also, importantly, for many people who are feeling vulnerable and scared, assure them that if they ring her hotline, they will see no enforcement action to remove them from the country because they are scared? when ringing that hot the uh, Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, as I said earlier, obviously individual cases will have different circumstances, but my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, will be setting out the the, uh, compensation scheme and she will do that shortly. Can I also say to the right honourable gentleman, on the second point that he raised, my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has made this clear on a number of occasions. The hotline is there to help people to be able to document, get the documents they need, to be able to clarify their status, such that they don't suffer from the problems uh, that the uh, constituent of my right the Right Honourable Gentleman has suffered from in the past. There, it is, she has also made it clear that there is no question of taking enforcement action when people ring that hotline. We actively want people to be ringing that hotline, to be bringing their cases forward so that the Home Office can help them to ensure that they've got the documents needed so that they can be reassured and will not see any problems in the future. Let's hear from a Baron, John Baron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank my right honourable friend for a very positive meeting about the need for NHS England to release all of the £200 million cancer transformation funding to frontline services so they can better deliver on the cancer strategy. However, since then, the system has been painfully slow in following through on what was agreed at that meeting. If this continues, will the Prime Minister meet with me so that we can unblock this logjam on behalf of cancer patients and their families? I say to my honourable friend that I'm sorry to hear that there has been still been some uh, uh, slowness in the system in relation to that. I will look into this uh, matter, and I'm quite happy, if necessary, if we're not able to unblock it, to meet him again. Thank you. Order. 